trying to find a unique kind of rendering of the cleansing of the temple there. And this is kind of a multicultural, very, very colorful rendering of what Jesus did in the temple that day. Most of the time, I think you'll agree with me, most of the time when people bring up the story about Jesus cleansing the temple, they use it to prove that Jesus was real. That he had real emotions. You hear things like, well, even Jesus got angry every once in a while. Uh -huh. And I understand why people do that because, I mean, think about what he did. Boy, oh boy, did he get angry that day. He comes into the temple courtyard, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm imagining this, I don't know how it actually happened, all of a sudden, it's like he snapped. He starts tipping things over, opening up bird cages, untying cows and sheep, throwing piles of money on the ground. He makes a whip out of rope. On the surface, we see an angry Jesus. In John's Gospel, just a few verses earlier, we see a very different Jesus in a very different setting. He and his disciples are attending a family wedding in Cana of Galilee. And you know the story. They run out of wine. And so Jesus at the prompting of his mother, turns water into wine. A lot of water into a lot of wine. John tells these two stories back to back, right at the beginning of his gospel. The other gospels have this at the last week of Jesus' life. John has this at the very beginning. Jesus is baptized. Jesus calls some followers. He goes to a wedding. He goes to the temple. I think John does that on purpose because John wants us to know something very important from the very beginning. Jesus changes water into wine and Jesus goes in and tears up the temple. Now, be honest. If those were the only two things you knew about Jesus, what would you think? What are the chances that you would follow this guy? Apparently he likes wine and he doesn't like animals very much. <laughs> now obviously, you have to look a bit deeper to discover what's really going on here. And I think you have to immerse yourself in the culture of that time to get a view of the deeper meaning that these two very different acts hold. You may not want to follow a Jesus who's only good at parties when the wine runs out and a bit of a catastrophe when you're trying to take him to church. But you may want to follow a Jesus who transforms social standing and rebels against religious elitism. All of that water that was turned into wine isn't there by accident. It was there so that the guests and the bride and the groom could go through all of the various rituals of purification required by their religion. The purification system was a really elaborate set of ritual activities that had grown over the centuries in order to name certain things as pure and other things as impure. For instance, and I, and I find this fascinating, women were impure for seven days after the birth of a son, but they were impure for 14 days after the birth of a daughter. <coughs> Dead bodies, impure. People with leprosy and other skin diseases, impure. Certain foods, unclean. And most everything sexual was impure. Marcus Borg, in his, in his book, one of his first books, Meeting Jesus Again for the First Time, 
makes a very compelling case for Jesus' ministry as a confrontation against this vast purity system. He points to the profound implications of the system itself. He writes, the effect of the purity system was to create a world with sharp social boundaries between pure and impure, righteous and sinner, whole and not whole, male and female, rich and poor, Jew and Gentile. So when Jesus took the water for purification and changed it into wine, he didn't do it to get this party started. It was an act of transformation, a breaking down of barriers, a different way of seeing the world and God's presence in it. And it is no accident that this miracle at Cana is the very first sign that Jesus performs in John's Gospel. And, it's no accident, the very next sign takes place in the temple. Because the temple had become the center of the purity system. The animals being sold in the courtyard are, are there for sacrificial purposes, but they are there and they are sold according to your ability to pay. There were economic implications for purity. Poor people who were barely scraping by couldn't afford to give a tenth of their crop away and then they found out that they were unable to sell their grain because it was judged impure because they couldn't give a tenth of it away. When it came to temple services the poor were unable to buy the best animals. The money changers they became a very important part of the system because Roman coins were considered impure and they could not be used to buy these sacrifices. The money changers weren't simply there giving change for 20. They were exchanging pure tokens for impure money and always an extra fee added on. In his first two acts, Jesus in the Gospel of John challenged the purity system in almost everything he did. It can't be a coincidence that there are so many stories about Jesus getting dirty, touching lepers, being touched by a hemorrhaging woman, going into a graveyard unclean, to cast out demons and send them into a herd of pigs also unclean. Eating, eating with outcasts. Outcasts, those were at the very bottom of the list of those deemed impure. Listen again to Marcus Moore. Jesus brought his challenge to the center of the purity system, the temple, with his action of driving out the money changers and sellers of sacrificial animals. His charge that the temple authorities had turned the temple into a den of robbers may very well refer to the economic interest that the temple elite had in the purity system. So regardless of what you heard as a kid, Jesus cleansing the temple isn't a warning about playing bingo in the fellowship hall. Neither is it about Christians being better than Jews. Because Centuries before Jesus came to Jerusalem for the Passover, the prophet Jeremiah stood before the temple crying out against it. Thus says the Lord, amend your ways and your doings. Let me dwell with you in this place. Do not trust in those deceptive words. This is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. Has this house which is called by my name become a den of robbers in your sight? You know, I too am watching, says the Lord. Jeremiah was calling people back to the heart of God. For God longed to dwell with them. God wanted to be at home with them. Now Jesus came into the temple not to be destructive or disruptive, but to wake us up 
and draw us back to the heart of God. Let me dwell with you in this place. The very first words from John's Gospel state that God came to dwell with us. That's the language that John uses to describe the coming of Jesus. There, is no, there are no shepherds, there's no manger, there are no dreams, there are no angel choirs singing. Instead, there is this rather cosmic yet down-to-earth announcement. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. You've probably heard that the Greek word, which is translated dwell among us, literally means to pitch a tent. Jesus is the Word of God trying to draw us back to the heart of God. To break through all that separates us from God and from one another. And this is where it comes home, folks. Just as Jesus attempted to get rid of all the clutter and the distractions in the temple courtyard, we need to get rid of all the clutter and distractions in our lives. That stuff that separates us from God and from each other. And I have to admit, most of the time, my mind is engaged in activity. I get a little anxious. What's up for tomorrow? What do I do? What do I need to do to get ready? What about this? What about that? Pam knows. Don't change plans at the last minute with me. I need to know what's coming. Our lives are so full of stuff, it's dangerous. Our garage is so full of stuff. <laughs> it's dangerous. We fill the courtyards of our lives with so much activity and distraction that it's a wonder we ever really feel alive. And then something comes along to remind you of what matters. On Friday night, Tam and I were heading home from a movie and we passed a place where you have an unobstructed view of the bay. And we looked, and it was an amazing, gorgeous sunset. Brenda's nodding her head, she saw it. So we stopped. We walked across the street, standing over this little field, and just looked at it. We held hands and looked at it. And then we heard the sound of other cars stopping and doors opening and closing as more and more people stopped to join us for the show. And soon one of our neighbors and her husband who were driving by stopped, walked up, standing next to us. They were also enjoying the view. All of us standing there in silence, just taking it in. After the show was over, we got to chatting with our neighbor. She happens to be a runner and we normally see her somewhere in the neighborhood running along. And she said that nearly every day she tries to end up there, in that place, around sunset. She stops and takes in the beauty of one glorious sunset after another. It made me realize that I can't tell you where I'm going to be at sunset. Therefore, I miss far more sunsets than I take in. I go through life missing far more than I take in. It's time to change things. It is time to get rid of all the busyness that consumes us and allow ourselves to sink our toes into the sand a little bit, to listen to the wind in the trees, to take the time to watch a whole sunset from beginning to end. God has graced us with so much goodness and potential that it is a crime to miss it. Jesus came into the temple to overturn every barrier that separates us from God. Jesus knelt down to wash his followers' feet and overturned the categories of master and servant. 
pure and impure forever. Jesus pitched his tent in our midst for a reason. Jesus overturns the tables in the temple for a reason, to get our attention and draw us back to the heart of God. And that begs the question, what is the heart of God? Well, in the Gospel of John, the message that comes most obviously from God's heart seems to be simple. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Everyone will know you follow me, not by categories of pure and impure, not by bringing the proper sacrifice, not by filling your lives with more stuff, but how you love one another. It's a simple command, isn't it? But it is a command that gets crushed under a complex purity system, and it can be lost in, our, in the complexities of our lives that are so full of clutter. The command to love one another can seem soft and naive in a world such as ours, where boundaries need to be clear and rules preside. Yet think about this. This was the command Jesus gave his disciples on his last night with them. He must have thought these words were very important. And we have every reason to believe